Well, I'm going to finish up on the, Holy, on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You mind if I sit down? <laughs> Everybody okay with that? Yeah. All right, good. I started off a few weeks ago talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit because that, that's what I felt the Holy Spirit wanted me to teach on. So it's been, I, I pray it's been good. Yeah. Um, I pray that we know the word. And one of the things that I think the last th thing I said to you the last time we met was God wants you to know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit because he wants you to be solid and rooted and grounded in the fact that he wants his people filled with, this, with the Holy Spirit. Not only does he want his people filled with the Holy Spirit, he wants them to pray in tongues. He wants them to be empowered by his spirit. There, I am not, and, and we've been reading the scriptures and we'll read a little, just a little bit more today. I'm gonna, but I'm going to end it on a little bit different note today of what um, God was saying to me through some other parts of the scripture. Um, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that the enemy has tried to make a, a controversy. And if you allow the enemy to turn it into a controversy, he will. And the only way you stay out of controversy is you just, you just believe the word. And once you believe the word, when the enemy comes along with whoever he brings along, you are rooted and grounded in the word. Because what I'm talking to you and what we've read in the scripture is not, doesn't have anything to do with the denomination. It's God's word. So in, in, as you run across people, you may encounter people that will say, well, that's not for us today. There's a, a lot of different stuff that the enemy throws at us. And a lot of times it comes from a, from a religious angle. But you need to know the word of God yourself. You need to know what the word is. God is requiring us to, to stand for the word. He's not asking you to stand for a group, a denomination, or any other such thing. But he is asking you to stand for the word. What does the word say? And will we use that as our banner, the banner of truth out of God's word? There's a lot of pressure today not to believe the word. There's a lot of pressure today to compromise and say, well, you know, that seems a little harsh. Do you do you really mean that, you know, would a loving God really condemn people? Uh, yeah, he would. Because when he does. When he does, and if he does, it will be a righteous act. And it won't be before he's given everyone involved plenty of time to repent. So when the hammer falls, it falls. Sorry. That's just the way it is. And you don't have to apologize for anything that God does. You just give people the word. Let the word stand on its own. Let the word do its own fighting. You and see, we get into this idea that we have to fight for the word. No, you don't. Only thing you have to do is put the word out there. You are what the word describes. You are the sower. That's all you are supposed to do is sow the word. You're not supposed to do any other thing but sow it. You may wind up having to water it, but you don't have to protect it in the way in the in the realm of, well, it's God's word and this. No, God is more than capable of protecting his word. You just sow the word. So just be rooted and grounded. We've read enough scripture, I think, and to really ground you in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we talked about, we went in Hebrews 5.12, and, and I'm not going to read these scriptures. In Hebrews 5.12, and we read through 6, 1 through 3, it taught, he, he says, the, the, the writer of the book of Hebrews is talking about, we don't want to be 
eating and drinking milk all of our lives. We want meat. He goes on in, in chapter six, where he says, not laying again the foundations of these things. And he, and he listed six different things. Can anyone tell me what those six are? Do you remember what they were? Resurrection <laughs> from the dead. Yeah, we're stuck on that one. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Resurrection of the dead. Ba uh, doctrine of baptisms. Laying on of hands. Laying on of hands. Repentance from dead works. What else? It was six of them. Faith towards God. And then there was one more. What was the other one? Well, if you, somebody's got a Bible there. Somebody bring us up to speed. <laughs> Everybody's looking at me. What, what, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to turn to it. You can turn to it if you want. But there were six different things that he talked about it in, in that. He said, these are basic foundational truths that we ought to be able to, to know. Judgment. Eternal judgment. Well, there is a big one. Well, I, I just kind of talked about that a little bit. Eternal judgment. Eternal judgment, for the most part, for the believer, is not a judgment. It's not a bad judgment. It is a judgment of your works. So understand that. That's one of the reasons. And God is God loves us so much. He wants to reward us so much. See, the world only rewards those that are in charge. But we're not of this world. I remember in the military, uh, we would do certain things in the military. And guess who got the promotion? The commanding officer. Everybody else was forgotten. But in God's kingdom, it's not like that. God knows exactly what your part is, and he's going to reward you accordingly to what you did in your part for what you played in, for what he was doing at any one given particular time. See, the colonel got the promotion. He got all the fanfare. He rode off into the sunset. And what did the rest of us get? Nothing. Maybe usually some more duty. One guy gets all of the glory but not in the kingdom. You will be rewarded according to what you have done in the flesh. That's why the scripture says, how should we build? With what? Gold, silver, and precious stones, right? Because all of the things that you are going to do, it says you can put wood, hay, or stubble on it, but what's going, how is this going to be judged? By fire. Keep that thought in mind. Fire. Laying on of hands. Keep that thought in mind. So all of these are the things that we are dealing with in the kingdom. But God is not, he's not somebody that's going to forget what you have done in the flesh. You just want to do, and I just want to do God's will for your life. That is why you have the Holy Spirit, to lead you and to teach you and say, do this. Don't do that. Go this direction. Go here. Go there. Don't go there. Without him, we're just kind of meandering in this in this in this darkness. But it says that he is a lamp under our feet. So if there's a lamp unto our feet, then it doesn't matter how dark it gets. We are able to see where we're walking. Right. You believe that? Well, it's true whether you believe it or not. It really is. So we covered that. Then we began to look at in Acts chapter one, four through eight. We saw Jesus commanded his disciples to wait for the for the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy he said, you wait for the promise of the spirit. You go to Jerusalem and you wait there. You don't do anything else until the Holy Spirit comes. They tried to argue with him a little well. They tried to get they they didn't argue with him, but they uh, asked him, well, what about are you going to um, bring the, the kingdom of God? He said, don't worry about those things that God has put in his own power in his own time. But you go and you wait for the promise of the father. In Acts chapter two, we say we see it says on the when the day of fully Pentecost was fully come, who showed up? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He showed up. 
He baptized them with fire. He baptized them. It was like a mighty rushing wind. There was something notice about, noticeable about his entrance. It wasn't a small thing. In fact, it was so noticeable. 3,000 people got saved because as, when they got filled, it stirred the whole place where they got filled. Peter began to preach, and it says about 3,000 people on that day got saved. Right? right. Now, the one of the things I want you un to understand and know and do not back off of when you get when people get filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, they do speak with other tongues. That is a sign of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That is scriptural. We looked at that. We went to Acts chapter eight and we went through Acts chapter eight and we saw how um, Simon was hanging out with Philip. Remember that? Good chapter to read on your own. Simon's hanging out with Philip. Simon is a sorcerer. He was, in fact, he was such a good sorcerer. He was such a good uh, demonic, um, how would you say, um, conjurer that he was making good money off of it. He had astounded the people. Everybody was looking to him. Everybody thought he was a great guy. But then he got saved. Then he gave his life to the Lord. So Simon understood manifestations of things. He was, he was already used to those kind of things. So here they are in Samaria. The apostles get wind of the Samaritans uh, being, receiving the Lord. They send who? John and Peter, remember? <laughs> they send John and Peter to Samaria. John and Peter show up. They get them saved. Now, they don't get them saved, but they do get them filled with the Spirit. Now, one of the things I want to encourage you, if you want to pray for people for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, do not be afraid to lay hands on them. That is scriptural. That is one of the, the, the basic doctrines that it talks about in Hebrews 6. Remember, laying on of hands. That is a basic doctrine. What is a, why is it that a basic doctrine? Because that, 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 is a, that is a physical, mental way of, of transferring that spirit. God has empowered you and he has blessed the works of your hands and he's blessed the pass of your feet. And so there is something about you laying hands on people that there's a transmission there. Even if even at the even at the at the point, if it's not a transmission, it is a point of their faith. Because a lot of times what I've heard people of old, you would say is, I'm going to lay hands on you and you will receive the Holy Spirit. That, that you're trying to get a person to, the, to a place in their faith where they can kind of see a, a contact point. You don't have to do it that way. You be led by the Spirit as the Spirit leads you. That's the whole point of the Holy Spirit. He will lead you differently than he leads me. He will lead you differently than the way he leads Jennifer. He will lead Daniel differently than he leads me. But it's the what? Same spirit, right? But what I do want you to understand is you need to understand the word. You need to have the word of God on the inside of you. You need to stand for the word. You need to know that it's the word of God that you give people. Your testimony is good. Nothing wrong with your testimony. But I can tell you by the, by the, by the power of God's word that the word of God will trump everything in our lives. Yes, we give our testimony. But you know, one of the things it talks about in the book of Revelation is that there were people were martyred for what? The word of God, for standing on the word of God. Revelations chapter six, it says that they're going to get white robes because of that. 
Now, I know we probably don't want to go down that road, but you know what? If you're martyred for God, let me tell you something. That's a high honor. That's a high honor. Now, I know that's not the greatest thing in, to talk about, but it does happen. We are living in a time where a lot of different things are happening. I think you've seen over the few years people have been beheaded. So it is not out of the realm of possibility. I don't know where God is going to send you and I. God gave me a dream one time about, about that, that idea of, of, of death. And it wasn't in, in, in that dream, and, and, and it was so vivid that here the guy was about ready to kill us, and I realized at that point how much I loved life, but... At that point also, it didn't matter. It was this duality going on. I love life that God gave me, but it's like, you know what? Whatever. Because the scripture says that we love not our lives unto what? Death. death. It says we have given away our lives. So death doesn't scare us any longer. Right? Well, it shouldn't anyway. And then we also looked at Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and his household received the word of God. Cornelius was a, a centurion of the Italian regiment. He and his household got saved because God looked at him. Here's a man that loved God, loved his people, gave alms, and, and, and he loved God so much that it, God took notice of it. He wasn't even he wasn't even in the Jewish nation, but he treated them right. He was, it didn't even say he was a proselyte. He, he was just somebody that loved God, but he expressed it through giving alms to God's people. And God bought him in him and his whole household. So we looked at that. That's when Peter went and 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 um, was able to get him and his household filled. And then remember in, cha in, in, in chapter 11, he had to go back to the Jews in Jerusalem and explain what they were saying. Why, why did you go to this guy who's a, who's a who's who's not part of the who's not a Jew and get him saved? And now all of a sudden he had to explain this and he explained. He says, hey, who was I? that they received the spirit of God just like it fell on us. Who was, I to, who was I to fight God? And they said, you know what? You're right. That's true. God is not a respecter of persons. He's bringing people in, into the kingdom. And then we looked at Acts chapter 19. Paul was at Ephesus. Let's go to Acts 19, and we'll launch off right there. We're going to read through that. In Acts 19... Someone want to read all the way through verse 1 through 7? Okay, go. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard of there, there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, And to then what were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who is to come out of him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. So here we see these men get saved. Now, notice what Paul says. He says in, in verse four, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe in him who would come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. Yeshua, the anointed one. Let's go over and let's look at what he's talking about in John's baptism. Go to Matthew chapter three. 
and let's read what it says here in Matthew chapter three. And then I can really kind of get into the, into the last part of this teaching. There's different ways to teach this lesson. I'm just teaching this the way I'm just led by the spirit of God. That's the best way. That's, that's, the, that's the only way I want to do it. In Acts chapter three, verse one, it says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For, th for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the, one, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, John himself was clothed in camel hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers. Now, was that very nice to say? Depends on your perspective is right. Sometimes God has you say things to get people's attention. I understand we're supposed to walk in love, but you re but um, what I want you to understand is always use the word of God. And, and who is our example? Jesus. Jesus. Look at his life and how he talked and treated people because there's times in here you could accuse him of not walking in love a lot of times, a lot of times. yes lot. He, he but you know what his whole point was tell them the truth and get them out of where they are to get them to life sometimes you have to say things to kind of slap people out of where they are and if you, you ought to know that, and I know that, it's hap that's happened in my life. Sometimes, you, you, you know, there was a commercial years ago, the guy would, it, it would put the, uh, what was it? Um, aftershave. aftershave. And he would come in and go, pow, pow. He's like, thanks, I needed that. <laughs> and sometimes that's what you and I need. Sometimes we need to be slapped or to wake us up or shake us out of where we are. Okay. Grayson wants the slice. Grayson will help. <laughs> and then there's the work of the flesh. <laughs> so, so sometimes we need to be slapped out of where we are. So here's John slapping these guys, waking them up because maybe they just came to do the religious thing just to come and see, hey, well, let's go out and find out what's going on out here. What can we tear down out here? Because we, we, you know, we, we got the goods. So he tells them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? All right, so you're here. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not think to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. That's that's a pretty bad indictment. So he was there, he was kind of saying, you'll claim Abraham as your father and that gives you an excuse for everything. Pretty much. Ab and they said that they said that to Yeshua all the time. In fact, there was one time where they went down that road and they were and they were talking to Jesus. They were talking to Yeshua. And he finally, when he'd had enough and he was trying to talk to them patiently, he looked at him and said, look, guys, your father is the devil. If you really want to strip it all back, yes, Abraham is your father. But if you take it back even further, really, 
Your father, because of the way you were born into this earth, your father is the devil. You're in his kingdom because you're not, your spirit hasn't been born again and recreated. Technically, that's where you are. God just has you out because you are obeying him in the covenant. But technically speaking, your father's the devil. He pulled the wraps off, didn't he? I mean, now that's that's pretty bad. Now, was that nice to say? <laughs> would, would you look at somebody today and say your father is the <laughs> devil? You could. <laughs> It depends. If, I'm led to. if you're led to, maybe you might be. I don't know. That's what Andrea told Grace. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. But it would it still would be true. If God leads you to talk to a sinner that way, well, you know what? Oh well. Maybe God's just trying to get their attention. So he goes on and he says here. He says. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Here's, here's fire. N notice that. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And if you remember, I'm not going to go into all the other scriptures. You know what how it says the angels are going to be doing some of this work here. Separating the wheat from the chaff. You remember some of those scriptures in. OK, it, it says that. OK. All right. But I want you to I want you to see here, he says you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. What I want to zero in on is the fire part. This is where we are. Fire is used for several different things. And in the scriptures, it's used a lot for purification. To purify gold, you must put it into the fire. I was think I was told it was seven, seven times it goes into the fire. And each time the goal goes into the fire, the goal is a type of you. Each time the goal goes into the fire, a certain amount of the impurities rises to the top. They pull the goal out of the fire, scrape the impurities off, and it goes back into the fire seven times and it keeps getting hotter and hotter. That's to bring the, 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 the impurities out. Is someone seeing something, a correlation here? Mm -hmm. Abraham was tested seven times. So it's backed up in the word. Yes. But I want you to see God has been speaking to us here lately I'm trying to contemporize this, bring it home. All of us are feeling that fire. We're all dealing with that. And God's bringing up the dross, the impurities out of your life. Yes, it may hurt. What, but what is the purpose of the fire? Is to make the gold what? Pure, Pure. right? Yeah. <coughs> the word says that we want to be what kind of vessels? Gold vessels. 
right? Mm -hmm. That's our aim. That's the goal is to get to being a pure vessel without the impurities. This is what God's doing with all of us. He's bringing up the impurities. And we all had them. It doesn't matter who we are. We all have our impurities. You and you deal with different things and I deal with, I deal with something different than he does and so forth and so forth. It just doesn't matter who's dealing with what. I don't care and neither should you. If you care that much and you know somebody's going through something, pray for them in the spirit. Just spend some time praying for them and then you go on about your business of being in the fire because we're all there. But we're there for a reason. God is taking us somewhere. God wants to do something with us. And for him to be able to do what he wants to do, he wants to get us to a certain place of purity. Because a, a lot of times, God, not a lot of times, but all the time, God knows where he wants us to be. He knows what he wants us to do. He sees where we are now and he, and he looks at it and says, hmm, that's got to go. This has got to go because if this and that and this doesn't go, that, this stuff is going to affect what they're going to do here. It is for our good. So whatever God is dealing with you about, just deal with it. And if you're not dealing with something, ask him to show you what you need to deal with. Ask him to show him. If you, if you, you know what? So don't feel that, it, you know, and, uh, and we, we have the term dying. Yes, and I think that's a good term. Dying to ourselves. Corpse, we talked about earlier. We talked about all of this stuff earlier. And as we were talking about it, I was sitting here thinking, wow, that's, that's, that's right in the wheelhouse of my message. It is for a reason. That we're going through this. Yes, some of it may hurt. Seemingly. Some of it's ugly. Yes. But you notice God's dealing with us about it. You're under no compunction to go tell every go. You are under no compunction to go tell everybody everything in your life, unless that's something that really needs to happen. That's usually something God's working in and out of your life. However, he does that. I don't know. There's millions of ways that God does this. He uses people, circumstances, you name it. God does it. Right. OK. All right. Now, when we read the scriptures in first Peter, one of the things that the Lord began to kind of capture my heart about was Noah. And as we read the scripture a few weeks ago, Noah just kind of stuck in my spirit. And I was like, God, what's, what's, what's the deal with Noah? So I began to, I went and researched Noah. And then that's how God began to give me the rest in the end of this message for our group here. In, in, in the word of God, you will see Noah mentioned, oh, that he's mentioned in Genesis 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Noah is also mentioned in 1 Chronicles 1 through 4. That's only a genealogy mention. He's also mentioned in Isaiah 54, 9. That is where God begins to talk about how he wants he he talks about how it's his covenant of being with you and he is never going to leave you or forsake you 
kind of along the lines of the covenant that he made with the earth. When God flooded the earth. There are covenants that God makes and has made that you and I have nothing to do with. And the covenant that God made with the earth was he said with Noah, when he finished with the with the flood situation, he said, I will never, ever, ever again flood the earth like I've done this time. I'll never do it. And as a sign, every time you see a what? A rainbow, that is my sign to you. And when do you see rainbows? You will usually when it rains. In other words, why do you see a rainbow when it rains? So that's exactly it. So that you can look at that physical sign that God put into this atmosphere that the earth will never be flooded again. Isn't there always sun also? There's sun. Well, there's sun, there's sun shining and, and rain. It's always associated with rain coming down. But you know what? Even though the rain came down, the word of God says it wasn't just the rain. It said God opened up the cisterns under the earth. It was flooded in two directions. It was flooded from beneath and it was flooded from above. The rain came down for 40 days. They were out in the weather 150 days. I was I went back and read this stuff. I'm like, hmm, I don't remember that, God, because I'm, I'm looking at this stuff religiously and not reading the word. God did some things in that in that whole deal with with Noah. When you go and you when you look at let, let me ask you a question. How many animals went into the into the ark? How did he do that? What happened when he's what was going on with the animals? Just to show you how maybe we don't read it because I didn't read it and I didn't see it. Yes. And what were they? Two by two. Seven of the others. I didn't even know that. I was like, whoa, I never I never knew that there was seven of one type and two of the other. Seven of the unclean. Seven of the unclean. OK. And on top of that, did Noah call the animals? Did they just came? You know how they came? They were called by God. God commanded them to go. Only thing Noah had to do was build the boat. Did Noah close the door? God closed the door. Let me ask you a question. Do you think after you had built the boat over 100 years, you think it would leak? <laughs> what if I built it? Never <laughs> they turned it alone. There, yes. Now, you know, as an engineer, when you build something, is it going to be 100% perfect? If I build it. <laughs> <laughs> Another layer. Another layer. <laughs> there you go, Lord. <laughs> From your mouth to God's ears. It's actually a prototype, you know. But normally, right. I need to build the production version version, and then it has bugs in it, and you keep fixing it. Thank you. But he had no you don't have a Thank you. But wait a minute. He didn't get a prototype. Uh -uh. No, and he didn't have a quality control team. No, he did not. <laughs> so you just think about this from, a, from, a, from that point of view. Right? I thought about what the hole in the side of the ship where the, boat, where the door was, traditionally, yeah. and how a wooden door is going to close up and not Leak. Thank you. <laughs> so think about what God did. I think it says God. Well, we don't know how he closed it. 
It said, God closed the door. God closed it and sealed it. I believe God closed and sealed that whole boat. Whatever what was left, whatever didn't get done, as long as he was doing what he was supposed to, God took care of the rest. Now, Noah, as, we, you're gonna, as we're going to see here, is mentioned several times in a certain way. So I'm getting you to think about what happened with Noah. Noah did an extraordinary feat. He built a boat and God was waiting for more than 100 years for people to obey. They did not. It said that they kept partying and having a good time all the way up until the very day that God closed the door. Right? That's what it says. Now it starts to rain. Now the water's coming up from the ground. But it's too late. Okay, so you, you have, I'm just forming a mental picture in your mind about Noah and what he did. So where I'm going to take you now is go to Ezekiel 14. Starting at verse 12. Does somebody want to read that all the way through? Do verse 23, from 12 to 23. Who wants to read that? I'll read it. Okay. And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, when a land sins against me by acting faithlessly and stretch out my hand, I stretch out my hand against it and break its supply of bread and send famine upon it and cut off from it man and beast. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, Job, were in it, they would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness, declares the Lord God. If I cause wild beasts to pass through the land and they ravage it, and it be made desolate so that no one may pass through because of the beasts, even if these three men were in, in it as I live, declares the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, they alone would be delivered, but the land would be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon that land and say, let a sword pass through the land that cut off from it man and beast. Though these three men were in, in it as I live, declares the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter, but they alone would be delivered. Or if I send a pestilence into the land and pour out my wrath upon it with blood to cut off from it man and beast, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it as I live, declares the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver but not but their own lives by their righteousness. For thus says the Lord God, how much more when I send upon Jerusalem my four disastrous acts of judgment, sword, famine, wild beasts, and pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. But behold, some survivors will be left in it, sons and daughters who will be brought out. Behold, when they come out to you and you see their ways and their deeds, you will be consoled for their disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem for all that I have brought upon it. They will console you when you see their ways and their deeds, and you shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, declares the Lord God. Now, notice the three examples God uses. Who are they? Daniel and Job. Now, what does the word say about Noah? Noah was a what? Righteous. Righteous man. Daniel was what? Righteous. And Job was what? Righteous man. And what did God use in this? See, I think we really need to pay attention to this example because now God's given an example. And I don't think God would use men's lives just flippantly. <laughs> if God is saying it, he's saying it with purpose. See, we use words flippantly. God doesn't use words flippantly. God doesn't say, I love you, like we say, I love bread. Or I love bacon. 
I love this. I, we use words, I think in a lot of ways we don't, we, we forget that words have meaning. So he uses the example of Noah, Daniel, and Job. Men who it says in the scripture were righteous before God, right? Why were they righteous before God? They were faithful. They were faithful. They followed God. What else? When they, messed up, they, they were obedient. Repented. They messed up. They repented. What else? They knew God. They knew God. They, they what? They walk with God. All those things we can say about these guys, right? What has God been saying to us? To righteous, to be holy. For a reason. For a reason. Yes. Do you, do you see where I'm going here? Absolutely. To be spirit to church. We already sense and believe and we've seen and people have had dreams about things that are going to be happening in the earth. God is preparing you and I just like he has been. He prepared Noah, just like he prepared Daniel, and just like he prepared Job. Job went through some things, Daniel went through some things, and Noah went through some things. You go back and you look through the lives of all these men. They went through things. It's not a coincidence that God uses these three men's lives as an example. Next thing, what did God just call out here? He called out what? He said, if I go with, so, notice how God said, suppose I do this. Do you think what God just said in Ezekiel 14, you think you could find it someplace else in the scripture? Where do you think you'd find those four examples in the scripture? Just as a guess, take a wild guess. Revelation. Revelation. What does that sound like? Four horsemen. The four horsemen. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if you go over to Revelation 6, you'll correlate every one of those things in Ezekiel 14 over in Revelation. Death, famine, Pestilence and wars. How did God say that they would come out of it? Because of their righteousness. righteousness. How are we going to come through what's going to be happening in the earth? Righteousness. Because of your righteousness. Not because we're born again. Not because we're born again, but you're walking you're, you look at the things that God has said about these men. You look at Job. The devil came up and what did God say about Job? Have you seen my servant Job? He's upright. He's, he, he's upright. He, he, he thinks about things. He thinks about my word. He wants to do what's right. He treats people right. He does things right. He puts my word first and foremost. Daniel was a stand up guy that said, no, I'm not bowing. No, we're not doing any of that crazy stuff. I serve God. Look at their attitudes. Look at the way they lived. It's not coincidence that God uses those three men's lives to talk to us about the things that are coming on the earth. And, as, and this, is, this is what was in my spirit. And I began to say, okay, God, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. That's what you're doing. This is what God's doing with us. Yep. He is preparing you. He's preparing your ark. 
He's preparing you to go through whatever you need to go through when the enemy thinks he's going to come and try to assail your character. God is preparing you and I. That's where we are. That's what we're doing. It's preparation time. Allison uh, asked me to read this to you, to you folks. Uh, she sent me this text last night, and let me, let me open it up. And she says, um, God has been speaking to me about further consecration and a fresh, deeper baptism in the spirit to reveal the, in, the anointing of the seven spirits of God. I have little understanding of this, but I have been listening to others all day discuss it. It seems that this is a common theme for 2019. Don't know, but it's always nice to hear that I am not the only one hearing those things. Um, I am fasting until the 15th. Um, the New Year of Trees, which is what this month here? Uh, Chevette. Is this Chevette, right? Yeah. Chevette. Is, is my, am I pronouncing that right? Chevette. 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 <laughs> the, the year, the new year of trees. And it is a blood wolf moon. This date seems to be a pattern for me. Trees equals people and nations. It determines the year in which you can eat of the fruit of the tree. There is something good and serious about this year, a year in which our flesh comes under taming. A wolf is fierce, but when tame can be loyal. Untamed, it will turn even on its own. This is a time to seek a deeper baptism in the spirit, the fullness of the spirit, the seven spirits representatives of the spirit himself. It's time to start doing the works of Jesus, who was full without measure. If I am not there, please say this to the group. The Spirit is forming a message in me and a strategy to get us where we need to go. To con continue to consecrate yourself and be holy as he is holy. Holiness, intercession, and an another baptism in a deeper revelation of the seven spirits of God is needed to get to the place we want to get to. So that's what she had. And I, I didn't even know any of what she was, she had, but this has been brewing in my spirit for weeks now. So I, you can see how God's bringing it all together. So I guess how I'm going to end this is don't think it's something unusual or anything like that. Whatever you're going through, you're going through. Get through it. Deal with it. Move on to the move on to the next fire. I, I believe we had a, a word, a, a prophetic word not long ago. And one of the things that God said was, turn your face into the fire. See, the natural tendency is, is there fire you turn away from it because it's hot. You want to get away. But God is saying with God's fire. Remember, it says in, in, in what did, what did uh, John the Baptist said? God's going to give us a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay. He's here to bring fire. So don't think it's strange. Yes, sir. You know, the <clears throat> same Job, Daniel and Noah and I'm looking at the meanings of those names and Job was persecuted hated uh, was the meaning and then Noah was rest and Daniel was God's judgment 
or God is judge. Think about that. If we're talking at the end, the end time, putting those three together it just makes sense. And the order he kept saying was no a day, no joke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rest. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Last night in prayer, um, John had a vision with a wolf-like, um, he described entity, um, just like while we were praying for someone and then our group too, he saw this and his description of it. Uh, John? No, no, no. Okay. Other John. Oh, okay. His description of it was how, uh, like, we woke it up and it's aware that uh, it wasn't something we handled, but it knows we're after it type of thing. Yeah, last night was really good prayer for us. We recognized, like, there's something specific after the women in our group and in this area that we prayed against and had confirming words. This John had a, a vision about when we were talking about joy actually was on Jennifer's heart and uh, he was seeing just like this cascading world and sand and like all this chaos and then like purple and then coming into clear waters. And Grayson, we, I asked Grayson to figure out like what was going on there and he pulled up um, Deborah. Deborah and the battle with the, the Canaanites and Canaan means purple. They used to refer to them as the purple people. So we're looking into that. But we're definitely coming in to a realization that whatever's happening, like with all of the women in our group, mm -hmm. is like a principality assignment yeah, against Grace us. You said it was like an identity thing. That's what you were getting, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you re now re remember where what's going on, that you can see some things happening in the natural. And remember, when you see some things in the natural, if you're not discerning them spiritually first, you can look at some things in the natural and say, hmm, a lot of times, most times they're just mirrors mm -hmm. of what's going on spiritually. <laughs> we have the women's movement. Yeah. The what the world calls the Me Too movement, which is good in, in a lot of ways. But I remember what, and I, and I don't mean but, putting it down, um, I'm using the but to, to say it something else. Um, what, Stephanie, what was um, well, Chris Valentin's book? Um, was, it, was the name of the book? Fashion Terrain. Fashion Terrain, where he talks about the... the, the um, how we have gotten women so wrong in the scriptures. It's so messed up. Guys are so, and yeah, I'm gonna tell you something, us guys are gonna have to lead that charge and make sure that, our, that women are next to us. God called us to be, them to be next to us. God took them, took the rib out of his side and placed her next to us, to man. In Genesis, in Genesis 5, 2, not Genesis, no. Adam called her Eve. God called them both Adam. So when he went into the garden and said, Adam, where are you? He wasn't talking to just the man. He was talking to the both of them. That's in Genesis 5, 2. Men have put women down. But from the beginning, it was not so. I'm going to take a line out of out of out of Jesus. So where is God bringing us back to the beginning of all things? God's restoring things. Us men have been the knuckleheads. We've allowed the devil to put women down because they have a glory all of their own and we complement one another. There's no war between men and women. I don't even know how I got on this, but I'm just wondering where your point is here. my point is. 
God's doing a lot of different things. And one of the things that he's doing now, when we see with the women's movement and all those kind of things is the identity. God's bringing women to a place where they need to be. They're not supposed to be two steps back to the right. That's not it. But we as guys have to help lead the charge in this. And one of the things that God said in, to Chris Valentin says, I'm going to be. See, God started the women's movement years ago. We just didn't know it. God started it. And he said to Chris Valentin, I want you to take this message to the Latin communities. He said, because if the because the devil wants to get a hold of it and turn it into rebellion. OK, but God is the one that started it. So the enemy will pervert everything. Well, the women's movement doesn't necessarily bring a simply a healing, balanced, no. proper position back. It goes to the point of creating man hatred. That right. That would just give it the opposite effect. This is the opposite effect. That's where that's where the enemy wants to take it. Well, Ed Cole explained it this way. When God took out of man, he took the glory, glory of God, the glory of man out. Adam had it all. He had both male and female. Mm -hmm. He had all of God. Mm -hmm. And when God took that, that brought that Unity. now the oneness has to come together. We spoke on this years ago mm -hmm. when we went to a conference and came back, knew that there was a oneness and it wouldn't leave us, and we got up and spoke what we could at the time. But mm -hmm. that oneness is bringing it all back all together. All back together. Amen. It's incredible. Amen. So, a lot of things are happening. That's my message, and I'm ending it on that, that we are in the place where we're at because... It's the righteousness that God is perfecting in us, not your own righteousness, not my own righteousness, but we're going, we are righteous in him as he cleans us up, moves us away from the flesh, moves us into the spirit. Because the more he moves us away from the flesh, it's going to be easier to get us cleaned up. Mm -hmm. Right? Because the only answer, Paul said it in Romans 8, Romans 7. He's the, you read that, he went through that whole thing. He said, I don't do the things that I want to do, even though the, I want to do right, but I do wrong. And then when I do wrong, I, don't, I know I should do right. And, and, and he got to that place. He said, oh, my God, who is going to deliver me? And then in Romans 8, that's where he begins to detail and delineate. You, you, you're, you're going to be free by walking in the spirit. You can't get free of the flesh by being in the flesh. It's impossible. You can't. Beat the flesh you, can't. You, can't. you can't. It's impossible. It's impossible. And to the, the point of the infilling of the Spirit, Jesus said, He will guide you in all truth. Yep. yep. That's why in our conflicts with people, if it's not out of prayer, and lifting people up and battling it in the spirit, we're just battling in flesh. In the flesh. Yes. We all do it. Yes. We gotta shake ourselves and say, Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. You need a slap? <laughs> <laughs> so pray in the spirit, that's gonna help you a lot. Does anybody have anything else? Because I'm finished, I'm done. Going into how uh, John called the Pharisees a brood of vipers, and how even though it looked a little unloving, it's because it needs to draw attention. And when we were in worship and the music stopped, um, I felt everyone kind of like sink in, like I couldn't worship. Not not everyone, but um, I felt like a shift where it's just like they sank in because they couldn't worship without someone saying the words for them. And I was going to say, like, don't let this get you down. This speaks to your, your alone time with God. If you can't worship to him in your alone time how you should without music, then you can't exactly. do it in public. It didn't stop you. You never began. Right. And 
what I got from Scripture was James 4, 8, where um, it says, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And I felt I saw sinners and double-minded, and I was like, that's a little harsh. But once again, it was to draw the attention. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else? Here's this song. We're knuckleheads. We need to be smacked around, because, I mean, we can run around the same stupid mountain 20, 30, 50, 60 years yeah. before we finally get it and change. Yeah. True. Shouldn't be so. Yeah. We don't have that much time. Well, that's all I have. Thank you. Are you yeah. Amen. I want to see if these guys. Does somebody, somebody there <laughs> have something? Have yeah, I have, I have a couple of things. Yes, good. Um, to crossing over was circumcision and and God is telling us circumcise our hearts he's saying come sure out of Babylon holiness is the key to crossing over mm -hmm. it really is and so my warning to us all as much as possible come out of Babylon and I'm, I'm not just saying it I'm saying it because I know to be true. God is going to judge Babylon at some point. It's time for us to live the way that Christ wants us to live. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge those subtle things, those subtle warnings in your spirit. Like we were talking about it last night at, at home. Places you're not supposed to be. Things you're doing you're not supposed to be doing. And you feel an unction that it's wrong. Yeah. Then stop. Leave the place, go, obey God. This is the time of practicing that oh, that that obedience to that still small voice. Yep. That's what I have. Yep. Amen.